Hi there, and welcome to Learn Roslyn Now. Today we're going to take a look at the uh, Visual Studio workspace and how you can use Roslyn to power Visual Studio extensions. Um, past episodes of Learn Roslyn Now have been relatively like uh, self-contained, maybe like 20, 40 lines of code at, ver at the very most. Um, this is going to be the first one that's a little different. There's a lot of uh, boilerplate involved in getting these things running. Um, and that's just the reality of doing Visual Studio extension uh, development. A lot of special sort of incantation that has to be done in order to get things hooked up properly. Um, so we'll jump right into it. Uh, you can do File, New Project, uh, under Extensibility. Um, and this extensibility option will only be available, I think, if you have the uh, Visual Studio SDK. So you're going to want to go ahead and um, get that if you don't have it already. And then what we'll do is we'll create this VSIX project. And you can tell by the number here that I've tried this a few different times, but we we'll run into some issues uh, on, on each filming. But uh, we'll go ahead this time, and hopefully this will be the one. Um, we'll, we'll start this up, and it's going to essentially uh, create a VSIX, which is uh, the default template for uh, Visual Studio extensions like VS Vim and, and Web Essentials or some of the other ones that you might have used. Um, there's a getting started tutorial here. Uh, we're not actually interested in that, so what we'll do is we'll just delete uh, that template or that uh, tutorial because we don't need that kicking around in our, our extension here. Um, but once that's gone, you can see that there's really nothing here. Um, there's no references at all. There's this VSIX manifest, but this really only um, uh, defines the contract between Visual Studio and our extension. You know, it's telling it what kind of components we're going to be providing Visual Studio within our extension, what to look for. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start adding some files. So we'll do uh, right-click the project, add, new item. We won't do a vanilla C sharp. Um, instead, we'll jump down to extensibility. And here there's these options, and they have uh, you know some templates for, for different kinds of tools that you might want to build. Um, and we'll choose custom tool window, and we'll call it uh, what's a what's a good name? I guess Visual Studio Workspace. So VS Workspace uh, Tool Window. Um, let's call it Seven because this is VSIX Project Seven, and I don't know if we use that name already. Um, so we'll we'll see once we get there. Um, but now it's going to go ahead and it'll get all the the DLLs that are required to build this tool window, to ship it into Visual Studio, to hook everything up for us. I mean, it really works right out of the box. You could go ahead and click play, and uh, and it would you know deploy successfully to Visual Studio and, and be good to go. Um, it wouldn't do anything interesting, but it would be uh, working at least. Um, and you'll notice we get this uh, WPF designer right off the bat. Uh, that's because the UI for all Visual Studio extensions is pretty much done in WPF. Um, we're not going to customize our extension today, so we'll just go ahead and close this. Uh, we're just going to look at the Visual Studio workspace, which means we're just going to be uh, kicking around in uh, code. And the file we're interested in is this VS Workspace Tool Window 7 uh, package. Uh, so if you named yours differently, it will end with the suffix package.cs. And this has essentially the boilerplate that we're going to um, work with today. There's a lot of comments in here that explain what's going on. Uh, probably worth reading if you've never created one of these before, but we're just going to focus on the code itself. Um, and once we've you know, gotten rid of those, you can see that there's actually not too much here. There's uh, just two really short methods, um, a unique identifier, just random GUID for our for our extension. And then like, you know, these these attributes that are saying, okay, we're going to provide a tool window, it's going to come to you as type VS, VS Workspace Tool Window 7. We're going to provide some menu resources, so that's for, uh, you know, drop down menus like this uh, or file menus within Visual Studio. Um, it'll tell them, like, you know, what icon to use, these sorts of things, what key bindings to use, if any. Um, but there's not too much to it. So uh, what we'll do is we will go ahead and actually I'm going to use the package manager console to bring down Roslyn. It seems to be a little more responsive than, than that custom window sometimes. Install package Microsoft.code analysis. <clears throat> and this has to bring down uh, quite a lot of things actually. Um, Roslyn has some dependencies on like system, I think it's not immutable and some MEF stuff and the new version of MEF, I think it's like MEF3 or MEF2 that they have. Um, so it's, it's got a lot of different stuff to pull down is the point and it's going to take some time to download all these references. Um, so we'll just look here. You can see that there's nothing in the constructor here. 
Um, and then there's this initialize, which doesn't do too much except tell uh, Visual Studio that there's a command related to our tool window, and then it initializes the base class here. Um, you can think of this package file as being like the main of our Visual Studio extension. This is the first place where code will run in our uh, extension once Visual Studio wants to initialize it and says, okay, you're good to go. Um, start you know, listening to events or start doing your work. Um, so this is where everything will get kicked off. Uh, so that, that first package has come down. Um, we actually have to add one more package. Uh, so we've never had to do this before in previous videos. But in today's video, we're going to have to add this Microsoft.VisualStudio.Language Services uh, NuGet package. And what this contains is the Visual Studio workspace itself and all of that sort of stuff to interface with Visual Studio. Um, and it failed here. And the reason it failed, and it might fail for you, so uh, so so keep an eye out for this, um, is because we're targeting .NET Framework 4.5.2 in this project. But um, I believe they built this with 4.6. Um, but I think we'll be safe and we'll set our .NET Framework to 4.6.1 just in case um, in case it was 4.6.1, so we don't have to you know, play around with these settings too much. So after that loads, um, we can just actually go back and click up, and this time it should pull down the, the DLLs with our Visual Studio workspace inside of them. Cool. So we'll put that uh, package manager away because we don't really care about that anymore. Um, and there are a couple different ways you can get access to Rosin, um, and it, it's worth just mentioning them even if we're not going to use them all. Uh, the first is Meth, and it is maybe marketed as the simplest, but in my experience not the simplest, and kind of a pain to debug. Actually, I know it's a pain to debug. Even even the Rosin team complains that it's a pain to debug. So um, so it can be it can be a pain. Uh, what you would you would in theory do is you do import and then the type so visual studio workspace and then give it a name my workspace <clears throat> and we'll just include our types here um, and in theory this is all you would kind of have to do this I would say this is probably the the, the driving goal of, of MEF would be to have something like this but in reality what you have to do is you know these if you've worked with MEF before, you know like you can only import within I think a class that exports unless you do some some special magic to hook everything up. Uh, you have to edit your VSIX manifest to tell Visual Studio that you're exporting from this project, and and even after doing some of that stuff, sometimes it just doesn't seem to work for me. So um, I've taken like a, a strong dislike towards that approach, and I like to use. Uh, this sort of code first approach. So there's no magic attributes here that I don't understand. I get to see what's going on and I get to see, you know, if things are null or not behaving properly. Um, but what what we'll do is we'll take a look at what this code is. You know, it's two lines, but, but what this is, is it gets this thing called the component model. And the component model, and this sounds kind of weird, is a service that gets you other services, I guess. So, you know, on the next line we say, component model, go and get us the service of type Visual Studio Workspace. Uh, we don't know how that type is created. We don't know who's going to put that type there. Um, but this is the type that it is, and someone should be expected to give this to us. And it goes out and it finds it for us. Um, and and puts it in our in our variable here, you know, returns it to us basically. Um, and this is the way I I like to to use uh, the the Visual Studio Workspace or get access to it. Um, but we need to add one more reference, and I saved it here because I always forget the name of it. Um, and this one, I don't think it's on NuGet, but I've actually never thought about that until now. I've always just sort of gone add reference, um, and then searched for it. But maybe it's worth investigating. Maybe someone put it up there. Um, and you'll see that there's two options here, uh, 14 and 12, you know, they differ only on version. Um, the idea here is that 14 corresponds to Visual Studio 2015, that's what we're using here, and 12 cons uh, is, is related to Visual Studio uh, 2013. Um, I guess they skipped on lucky number 13. But uh, we don't care about Visual Studio 2013 in this extension, or at least in this demo, so we're just going to use the, the latest version. And then we'll bring in the references that we need. I hope that was the one. Yeah, that's okay. Cool. 
All right, so now in theory when we ran this and our package got initialized, we would have our workspace and we could do things with it. So let's take a look at you know what kinds of things we can do. Um, it's really, I don't think, any different like in terms of a public API than any other workspace. You've got like a current solution. You've got a uh, current solution has projects on it. Uh, those projects, oh, am I missing something? Dot select. Is there not a select on this? Must be missing a link. Yeah. Um, you know, these projects have documents and so on. It, it's no, no different than like our MS Build workspace demo that we we're using in, in the previous example. Um, you can do things like try apply changes so we can give it a new solution to override the old one. I think I think this is implemented. I'm not 100% sure now that I think of it. I've never actually tried to apply changes to it, but I think what this would do is in your user's Visual Studio, it would like uh, change their documents or change their projects, however, um, you know, whatever changes you'd made to them in this new solution you were passing in. Um, but what we're going to look at and what's probably in my my experience the most useful is one of these events and there's uh, events for document closed and document open if you're interested in those uh, maybe you want to do some custom like uh, adornment or something like that and you want to wait till the documents open to, to to you know pop it up there or something you could maybe listen to that event um, but this workspace changed event is sort of the big one um, and this gives you access to um, when projects are changed, when documents are changed, when the solutions change, when references are changed, everything that could be changed within a workspace basically um, will will fire this event. And the way you distinguish, because you don't want to handle all of that stuff, is you could like, uh, or what I do is I switch on the kind um, of event that comes in here. So let me clean this up a little bit here. Uh, we'll just get workspace event args. We get this uh, event args E, um, and it's got a few things on it but but like I said the most important is the kind the first thing we want to do is figure out like what kind of event are we dealing with here um, and you do that with workspace change kind and you can filter based on you know a doc additional document was added a regular document was added project added project changed um, solution added changed all these sorts of things um, so I said references change but I actually think you would probably have to listen to uh, project changed and then you know figure it out based on uh, the new project or something like that. It doesn't look like there's actually something explicitly for references in here. Um, but what we'll do today is we'll just look for document change. So this is when like text in a document gets changed. Uh, what what do we want to do? So what I guess we could do is we'll just print this to uh, the debug console. Nothing too too exciting, but it should demonstrate that everything works here. Um, and we'll print. Let's take a look at this E really quickly. Uh, that the kind we've used so far. What we'll print is we'll print the document ID. Uh, but you can also look to see like there's a new solution with every new document change that comes through. Um, there's an old solution, so what existed before, um, and also the project ID, probably where this document exists. So we'll just print out this document ID, and then we will break. So. That was a lot, I think like 10 minutes of setup to uh, to get to the part where we finally run code. Um, and this part takes a little while too. So what happens when you, when you get to run your code is it fires up a whole new Visual Studio actually. Um, so you end up debugging Visual Studio inside of Visual Studio. Um, which can be strange the first, it can be exciting the first few times, but it gets tedious, uh, I'd say after the hundredth time when you, you wait for it to load for, you know, 60 seconds or something like that. It can take some time to, to fire up a whole new Visual Studio with the debugger attached. It's got to, uh, to load a lot of DLLs and, and all these different references and stuff. And my, my laptop's really weak. It's got like four gigs of RAM. So having, you know, Visual Studios, debugging other Visual Studios really, really stresses it out, especially when you're recording video on it. But you can see um, this new Visual Studio is opening up. Uh, it's called the Experimental Hive. Um, I, I guess Hive comes from the registry uh, because the experimental version of Visual Studio that, that boots up here has its own registry settings. So uh, you can be relatively, you know, you can be comforted by the fact that I don't think you can break this instance of Visual Studio and it will like affect your main Visual Studio in, in any way. You wouldn't want to be developing Visual Studio extensions at the risk of breaking your, 
you know, what you're using to build them. Um, so that's great. We've got uh, our Visual Studio Experimental instance. Uh, it's kind of annoying that like they're identical. Sometimes they can be mixed up. Uh, you can change the color on them. But if I'm getting on a tangent here, but but that, if you're if you're roaming, it will hook up the colors together. So we we won't do it. Uh, we won't do that today. Um, anyways, we'll just fire up console application one, just a really basic console application. I, I think it has like one method. I was doing some tests with lists in here or something. And when that boots up, we'll launch our tool window and kick everything off. Let me make sure I have my breakpoint set. No, I don't. Good thing I checked. Actually, we'll put the breakpoint in the case and we'll put this one here so we can listen to and see everything that comes through this component model. So uh, our, our secondary Visual Studio has, has loaded. Um, nothing too exciting. Uh, our, our, in reality, our, our Visual Studio extension hasn't loaded yet um, because it's waiting for us to interact with it for the first time. So the way we would kick off a tool window is they all live in other tool windows. Um, and ours is at the bottom here, VS Workspace Tool Windows 7. Um, so I click that. Uh, Visual Studio recognizes, oh, I got to go load this extension. Let's go initialize it. And then our code finally gets run. So if we step through here, we should see hopefully this component model is not null. That's very slow. Um, yeah, that's great. So the component model is fine. Uh, we get our workspace. Uh, we can probably drill down in there quickly. There's a current solution. Uh, points to our console application one solution. It's got the projects and documents that you'd expect. Um, and then we hook up the event. Uh, in this case, we're not ever you know, unhooking that event, so that's something to be aware of. Um, and then we actually don't need this anymore. This is just sort of like the, the nice way to load your Visual Studio extension. But now that that's good, um, we can start making changes. So let's like delete a line of text. And you can see um, we have this document ID come, comes in. It's got kind uh, document change. It's giving you the old solution and the new solution uh, and a project ID. Um, and then it should probably print out the name of this document ID to our debug window here. So F10. Yep. And you see it just kick in down here. Uh, what you would usually do if you were doing something useful is you might like take this document ID and you look at the old solution and the new solution and you'd get the text for both and you'd do a diff on them or something like that. You'd kind of do some before and after or you'd update some state uh, in your Visual Studio extension depending on what you're building. But that's, uh, that's how you use the Visual Studio uh, extension or workspace um, in an extension. Uh, you can see that it was a lot of work for a pretty simple demo. I guess it, technically it came out to 20 lines of code that we cared about, but in reality there's all kinds of stuff going on uh, under the hood, all, the, all this pre-generated stuff. So um, hopefully that you know gave you a little bit of a taste for what this, this kind of dev is like and, and working with these things. Um, if you have any questions, reach out to me either on Twitter or in the comments below, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Um, hopefully we'll we'll get back to a more regularly scheduled video. I kind of fell off over the holidays, but um, you know, thanks for watching, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it.